We've all heard about the Great Reset, and we've all heard about the agendas that are out there at play that most are blinded to, and others willingly choose the, to look the other way. In today's video, I want to talk about the Great Reset and the upcoming economy of the Antichrist. I will try to make it a short video, as short as I possibly can. And I'm sure that I'll have different editions on this because there's so much to cover. But this is simply like an introduction. In the book of Revelation, it tells us of a day in Revelation 13, 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Never in history have we had a moment where the infrastructure is being set up and put into place where this can be possible. Now allow me to take you back to a brief history lesson because there is nothing new under the sun. Before you had microchips in Sweden, before you had mandates that ask of certain things for you to travel, in Genesis 11, this was after the flood, we see that there is a gentleman called Nimrod. And, and this being is essentially a prototype of what you're going to see in the end of days. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. And they have all one language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do in history you see that satan places an imagination upon people who have that spirit of the antichrist inside of them Nimrod promised them security. Nimrod promised them a city. Nimrod promised them so much economic prosperity. Yet Nimrod was defeated. And as you go through history, you're going to see in Nero as an example, a man who persecuted so many people, including a lot of Christians upon that time. He was also a prototype of the Antichrist. You're going to see it through so many leaders in world history. And you're going to see it as we continue to live on. As the word of God says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, it is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. The tricks of Satan, they may be repackaged differently, but they're simply the same. All the members of humanity... Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? The Antichrist spirit is a narcissistic spirit that aims at controlling your whole home in a diabolical way. Today we'll take a look at the Great Reset and how the economy of the Antichrist is slowly but surely being built all around you and has been being built all around you for many, 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 many years. Let's begin with currency. You know, there was once upon a time that if you decided that you wanted to trade with me, I can give you three goats and you would give me a cow. We could look at what we're trading and say, well, that, that cow is pretty old, so maybe I'll give you one goat because she's, she's pretty old. And we would determine the value of something based on a conversation. Our conversation was just between you and I as a farmer. The powers that be, being that they have that type of narcissistic and you'll see this in most CEOs. You will see this in many world leaders. They all want to control you. They all want a piece of the pie. Those days where you and I could trade without there being a central bank. Those days where you and I can make a purchase or a sale transaction without there being a middleman is gone. 
Time now for the executive edge. And today we're taking a closer look at a new law that requires payment apps to report business transactions to the IRS. Robert Frank joins us now with more. Robert, what are we talking about? You Venmo somebody money and the IRS is watching? They absolutely are, Becky. Good morning. Good to see you. Now, this is a new law that requires third-party payment services like, as you mentioned, Venmo, PayPal, or even Cash App to report transactions over $600 a year for all corporate accounts. Now, if you sell a service or business or product and are paid through a third party, including Airbnb or eBay, those transactions will now go to the IRS and you will get a 1099-K form. Now, the law was part of the American Rescue Act that was passed last year and was aimed at cracking down on tax evasion, but it has sparked a lot of controversy. There was a day and age that if I'm a farmer and you're a farmer and we wanted to trade, we could simply trade. You could give me a cow, I can give you three goats. There would be no middleman. It would just be between you and I. If you needed services, I could go to you and say, may I have a couple of goats and I will build you a house. And that's how the system worked. It worked on a bartering type of a basis. It worked on us trading commodities so that this way the economy could function. It was also based on a trust system because if you decided today to lend me a cow, you would trust that I'm going to live up to those standards and repay it with the barter bartering that we agreed upon. Eventually that led to actual shekels, coins, if you will, um, precious metals silver, gold, which you already know about. You will notice that the Antichrist spirit always wants to be very nosy, and you will notice that the Antichrist spirit always wants to be in the middle of everything. The Antichrist spirit will always tell you that it's there to protect you, when in reality, it is there to take from you. It is there to be that middleman to watch the whole thing go through, so that then they can take from you and take from them and control the whole scenario. And before you had the modern day central banks that you see today, that same type of greed, that same type of spirit lived on with the goldsmiths, which gave you receipts. Most of us believe that banks lend out money that has been entrusted to them by depositors. Easy to picture, but not the truth. In fact, banks create the money they loan, not from the bank's own earnings, not from the money deposited, but directly from the borrower's promise to repay. The borrower's signature on the loan papers is an obligation to pay the bank the amount of the loan plus interest or lose the house, the car, whatever asset was pledged as collateral. That's a big commitment from the borrower. What does the same signature require of the bank? The bank gets to conjure into existence the amount of the loan and just write it into the borrower's account. Sound far-fetched? Surely that can't be true, but it is. To demonstrate how this miracle of modern banking came about, consider this simple story, The Goldsmith's Tale. Once upon various times, pretty much anything was used as money. It just had to be portable, and enough people had to have faith that it could later be exchanged for things of real value, like food, clothing, and shelter. Shells, cocoa beans, pretty stones, even feathers have been used as money. Gold and silver were attractive, soft, and easy to work with, so some cultures became expert with these metals. Goldsmiths made trade much easier by casting coins, standardized units of these metals whose weight and purity was certified. Well, to protect his gold, the goldsmith needed a vault, and soon his fellow townsmen were knocking on his door wanting to rent space to safeguard their own coins and valuables. Before long, the goldsmith was renting every shelf in the vault and earning a small income from his vault rental business. Years went by and the goldsmith made an astute observation. Depositors rarely came in to remove their actual physical gold and they never all came in at once. That was because the claim checks the goldsmith had written as receipts for the gold were being traded in the marketplace as if they were the gold itself. This paper money was far more convenient than heavy coins, and amounts could simply be written instead of laboriously counted one by one for each transaction. Meanwhile, the goldsmith had another business. He lent out his gold, charging interest. Well, his convenient claim check money came into acceptance, 
borrowers began asking for their loans in the form of these claim checks instead of the actual metal. As industry expanded, more and more people asked the goldsmith for loans. This gave the goldsmith an even better idea. He knew that very few of his depositors ever removed their actual gold, so the goldsmith figured he could easily get away with lending out claim checks against his depositors' gold in addition to his own. As long as the loans were repaid, his depositors would be none the wiser and no worse off. And the goldsmith, now more banker than artisan, would make a far greater profit than he could by lending only his own gold. For years, the goldsmith secretly enjoyed a good income from the interest earned on everybody else's deposits. Now a prominent lender, he grew steadily richer than his fellow townsmen, and he flaunted it. That same spirit lived on with the goldsmiths. You see, someone at some point in time needed a place to store gold. So you would take it to a goldsmith, they would store your gold and give you a receipt. And this receipt was as good as gold. Because if you ever wanted to cash out that goldsmith receipt, you can go to the location that he or she gave you and pick up your gold. And you trusted that the gold was there. The problem is, eventually, the same thing that you see now, they began to give more goldsmith receipts than the actual gold that they had in store. This resulted in a lot of bank runs that you would hear about, right? Uh, this resulted in people not trusting that particular system because the same thing that you see now where money is printed without it having some sort of a backup, there's nothing new under the sun. For the central bank, the Federal Reserve, all of that, it has been done throughout centuries. The devil is such a manipulator, such a liar, that this system has been tried and perfected through throughout time. That goldsmith type of a system where they gave you a receipt when you gave a deposit eventually turned into our banking system, the UNIC today. The problem with the banking system to them was that people would hold banks accountable and they don't like to be held accountable. You see, God forbid that you would deposit $100 and you would expect to go pick up that $100. Oh no, how dare you expect from us? How dare you expect us to give you what you deposited? That's their narcissistic mentality, that how dare you ask back what you deposited? That's, no, it doesn't work that way. So we had many panics in the 1800s. Um, so many of these panics caused a lot of bank runs. People would go to the bank and take all of their money, damaging the whole financial system. This led towards them creating what you and I know as central banks, okay? And a lot of meetings went into these central banks. Uh, in 1906, JP Morgan and the Panic of 1907 and all, all of these things. So many different conversations and so many different reinventions of this system was taking shape and this was happening in different parts of the world as well. Money. You put it in the bank and it's there when you want it. But what if you went to the ATM and the bank didn't have your cash? It happened in the past. And that's why the Federal Reserve was created. To keep the financial system stable. The Fed provides short-term loans to banks so they have enough money on hand in times of financial stress. But travel back in time to before 1913. No one was responsible for the health of our banking system. There was no lender of last resort. Why? Because from our country's earliest history, some people opposed a central bank. They feared it would put too much power in too few hands. But as the country grew, frequent banking panics kept the economy on a roller coaster ride, complete with ups and downs, chills and spills. The last straw came in 1907. One of Wall Street's largest financial institutions, the Knickerbocker Trust Company, went bankrupt. Panic was widespread. People raced to withdraw their savings, only to find that banks didn't have cash available. Financier J.P. Morgan and a group of investors rescued the economy with emergency loans to banks. But it was clear that relying on wealthy individuals 
wasn't the right long-term solution for the nation. It was time for a change. The United States needed a strong central bank that would keep money flowing during times of crisis and help prevent bank runs. Eventually, it got to the point where in 1933, the United States of America confiscated gold. Yes, the land of the free. The USA, yes, the land of the free. America confiscated gold. Could you imagine if that happened today? Well, it happened then. 80 years ago today, the day the federal government took all our gold, it changed the precious metal as we know it. So let's start with a little history lesson. April 5th, 1933, FDR uh, confiscated every gold coin, bullion, and certificate. People had to basically turn in their gold to the federal government. If not, they face up to 10 years in prison or a $10,000 fine. That's almost $179,000 in today's money. Now, you were able to keep a small amount or rare coins, but those who did give up their gold got about $20, $20 an ounce. So why did the government do this? Well, to prevent hoarding devaluing the dollar during the Great Depression. And then the Federal Reserve set the gold price at $35, pegging the dollar to the commodity. But this could never happen again, right? We'll tell that to Texas. The state uh, is contemplating a bill to create the Texas Bullion Depository to protect its own gold. The state would abandon its storage in New York and move their gold stateside. And if the government comes for it, Texas is prepared to fight with the 10th Amendment, arguing that states' rights trump any confiscation order by the federal government. Well, the United States of America did it. They confiscated gold. There were a lot of penalties if you did not comply with turning in your gold. And they paid you a price for your gold. And after it was all confiscated, they raised the price of gold. And this is the history based on the country that I'm in, America. You have to go through your own nation to know what the monetary history is there, but you will probably find that it's the same scam. The reality is, is that if today everyone decided that they wanted to be paid for their debt, there would be no money to pay for it. No amount of gold, no amount of silver, no amount of anything would be able to satisfy the debt that this world has. So they create this narrative of the Great Reset to help you. But in reality, it's not to help you. It's to help them. Because they've cornered themselves into a position that their financial invention can no longer continue. But they still want to keep you a slave to their monetary system. So the Great Reset will be repackaged and sold to you at some point in time in the future. So once the United States confiscated gold, there was still a trust system in the US dollar. And I'm going really fast through this. We could spend hours talking about it, but I'm giving you the condensed version. There was still a very big trust in the United States dollar around the world because it essentially was pegged to gold. The same thing that the goldsmiths were doing then where they would tell you to deposit your gold and they would give you a receipt that's what the dollar was. It was a receipt that when you used the dollar, it meant something. There was something to back it. The problem is, is that the United States of America didn't like to be held responsible. So as nations began to actually cash in on their receipt, guess what happened? The United States of America didn't have the money to pay for it. Monetary sanity, convertibility, had been restored in Europe in 1959, and almost immediately thereafter, the United States began running enormous balance of payments deficits year in and year out. Bretton Woods established an arrangement whereby supposedly from 1945 and the end of the war onward, all currencies were convertible to the dollar and the dollar to gold. At that time, gold reserves were the final mechanism for settling balance of payments deficits. But Bretton Woods forestalled this process by permitting the sole reserve currency, the main reserve currency, to be considered as official reserves for foreign central banks such that they could settle all their, their deficits in dollars as opposed to gold. That's the fundamental difference between the classical gold standard and what is called the gold exchange standard, which Bretton Woods enshrined in law 
and in treaty, when we were spending more bro money abroad than we were taking in, all the foreign countries, uh, especially in Europe and, and in Japan, absorbed these dollars pouring into their economies and they held them in their reserves. They immediately take those dollars and reinvest them in the New York money market. Thus, the Americans, were, I should say the American government, um, were able to buy abroad and buy at home at the same time. And gradually, this vast foreign exchange component built up as a claim against gold. And in 1971, both Britain and several other countries decided to encash their huge accumulations of dollar reserves under the Bretton Woods system for gold and, of course, uh, President Nixon, in his own way, decided to trump them. George says, as long as we do not have convertibility, he says, the Europeans can't do all that much to us. They can't. Because he says, when we had convertibility, then they had a right to lecture us That's about right. what we ought to do. But with That's convertibility, right. uh, without convertibility, uh, that that is not the case. These countries had the right to claim gold to redeem their dollar reserves, it would put the United States in a position of insolvency. We just shouldn't get all that excited about the yeah, fact that they worry about our budget. Is that your view? That's exactly right. They can't do one cockeyed thing. and They'll say, oh, well, we've got to maintain our relations. We've asked them to hold dollars. And I said, no, we didn't ask them to hold dollars. They've held dollars. It's been in their interest to hold dollars. That's right. And I said, the hell with them. I am. I'm not worried about right. them. I'm worried about us. That's right. Uh, 1960s was filled with financial crises that involved the dollar, but the total collapse came in 1971. He issued an executive order on August 15, 1971, and said, I'm sorry, we're not paying our debts. We're certainly not paying our debts in gold. And what did America do? Did it do the right thing? This is the land of the free, come on, man. This is the land of milk and honey, you know? The American dream, the white picket fence. We honor our commitments, Biden says in, in 2022. Well, it's been the same old story throughout history. No matter what the leader is, no matter what the organization is, it could be Nimrod, it could be Nero, it could be Biden, it could be Trump, it could be anybody. Satan is a deceiver. And we're not from this worldly kingdom. We're not from this earth. But as we learn how this earth works, you keep on seeing the same traits of the Antichrist spirit at work. In 1971, Nixon killed the gold standard. All of these nations were coming to the United States saying, hey, I, I have a paper receipt. I, this, this dollar says I can cash out in gold. Well, Nixon said, that's done in a way with. You can no longer cash out in gold. And that brought forth the fiat currency system. And with the fiat currency system, that little paper that you have in your hand, the only thing that is keeping it from actually being devalued is you thinking that it's actually worth something. And another thing that's keeping it from losing its value is the fact that just about every type of leader that has tried to leave the petrodollar to leave the fiat currency of the United States of America has found himself in a very, very big war. It was a time and a day where the paper dollar was worth its weight in gold now the only thing backing the paper dollar the fiat dollar is war and that can only run its course up to a certain way you see world war one led to the league of nations world war two led to the united nations what's going to happen if a world war three breaks out whomever wins will be the leader again and we'll have maybe a bigger version of the united nations maybe the new world order who knows Fiat money ran its course, and now we have cryptocurrencies, and we have a digital economic system, which I want to wait till the end of this video to actually discuss in the new digital economy. It's Satan's playground. He loves it. And we'll discuss that in just a moment. But I want to talk about an example that I have for you, because in the economy of the Antichrist is not just about controlling the economy, it's also about keeping track of the people. It's also about making sure that you have population control. We all know that right now, if you see the color red, you know that that means stop, instant. Green, good to go. Yellow, caution, right? That's been ingrained in us since we were babies. 
we're that type of a society. And, you know, I'm not saying that traffic lights are bad because they make sure that the traffic is safe. However, we've been indoctrinated in a certain type of way of thinking since we were born and we were in kindergarten. Okay? It's just how it works. And let's talk about travel. There was a time in a day that if you and I wanted to go somewhere, we can get on a horse and a buggy and just drive there. You know, you can get on a horse and just go on all down. You can build a raft, you can build a boat, you can travel where you wanted to go Go to. The, the Vikings were in America way before Christopher Columbus and that narrative that they give you. Africans had traveled to the Americas before Christopher Columbus and all that narrative that they give you. It was a time in the day that if you wanted to, that if you wanted to simply go on down to another state, you were free to do so, right? Just get on your horse and go. Can you get in a car today and actually drive without a license? Can you travel from one state to another without stopping at the counter, right? If you're going to be flying, as an example, showing your ID. And now in America, they have a real ID where you have to submit even more documents to get the real ID. You see, it's not just an ID. No, you need the real ID, right? And then they check if you have the valid permissions, a valid driver's license, if you want to rent a car. Everything is permission based in this new system that we live in. And yes, it has its pros. And yes, obviously, I get all the pros. But what I'm trying to share with you is, is that slowly but surely, they've applied that time that type of permission based system to everything and anything that you and I do. You can own a car. You can think that you own a car, but can you drive that car without their permission? No, you need a license, right? For them to even let you drive. Then you need a tag every year. You have to get it inspected in certain states. It has to pass their inspection in certain states. You have to have insurance. You have to do so much. Do you even really own that car? It's all about keeping tabs of the population. It's all about making sure that the population is controlled and that the population is observed and that they know what vehicles are out in the car, how many vehicles are out there, everything. That same type of a system that you have in travel, where you want to go to another country, you need to show your passport. It has to have permission. You have to have the, the right permission to enter, permit. That same time of that same type of permit type of a system, a permission-based system, of system of licenses that you can enter, go, come, and be back and turn around. It's the same system that you're seeing in the digital economy that is rising among you. You know, the great reset, right? And now I want to go back to where we were talking about currency because hopefully you can now understand a little bit more of what I'm talking about. When it comes to actual currency, right, that you and I use, and as they mentioned, the Great Reset, where they tell you that you will own nothing and you will be happy. Most immediately throw their hands up and say, nope, wait, it's a crime against humanity. It's wrong. That's diabolical. And you're right. It's wrong. But here's the problem. This is something that has been going on for a long time. I want you to think about when you turn on Netflix. What are you paying for? Do you own any of those movies? No, you will own nothing and you will be happy. I bet you when you shut off that TV, you felt satisfied that you had all of those different types of programs there before you. Well, do you know what those programs are? A bunch of different licenses. Every single movie has a license that Netflix decides to buy that organization and then rent that out to you in one monthly fee, but it's never really yours. It's a permission-based type of a system. It truly is full of convenience for a lot of people, but I want you to understand that what one day is convenient, another day turns into bondage. Let me give you an example on Amazon. If you decide to purchase a movie on Amazon, is it really ever yours? It never is yours. Read the terms and conditions. When you purchase a series on Amazon, when you purchase a film on Amazon, and not just Amazon, in any virtual store, anything that you purchase digitally, what the great what what does the great reset says? You will own nothing and you'll still be happy. You never really own any of those episodes. You never really own any of those films. You don't own them. All you did was purchase the license to view it, similar to when you get a license to drive. That's the future economy. It's an economy based on permission and licenses. Don't you remember the day that if you wanted to actually 
get a movie, you would go to Walmart and purchase the actual cassette, movie cassette. You had a VCR and you owned that film. You owned that actual film. And if you were in a bind in a difficult moment, I remember going to pawn shops. And I was in a bind and I would actually take a, a physical copy of something and sell that physical copy because I owned it. Imagine the perfect video store. It would have a great selection, right? Right, over 10,000 videos. Three evening rentals, so no rush, no hassle. Fast checkout, 24-hour quick drop return, open late every night. Well, the perfect video store... Welcome to Blockbuster Video. ...is popping up all over the country. There's one near you. Blockbuster Video. Wow, what a difference. Where can I do that with a digital type of a purchase? Where can I trade that in? I can't because I do not own it. I may be happy when I'm watching it, but I do not ever own it. And this goes very deep because if you look at music nowadays, back in the day, and this is when I was worldly, I used to love Wu-Tang, DMX, uh, Fat Joe, all of these things back in the day, Busta Rhymes, and all, and all these CDs when they used to come out, Raekwon, um, the Jizza, all of these people. When their CD came out, I would go and buy it faithfully when I was in the world. It would cost $15, $16. I would pop in the CD so then I can listen to it. And then I would actually trade the CDs with other friends. And they would trade their commodity with me. And we would trade back and forth like it was currency. I can't do that no more. Now you have something like Spotify. Where if you actually want to listen to the song, you pay the monthly subscription so that you can listen to the music. But all of these musics are simply licenses that you're listening to. You don't ever own it. Not that I would want to own any of that content. I'm only using that as an example. That is the future economy, okay? For most people that have a car that they're paying for it monthly, for example. You pay for a vehicle for five, six years, then you have to trade it in and you go through the whole thing all over again. You really don't even own that. And now they're actually moving forward with a system of car subscriptions. Yes, you pay one monthly fee. It includes the car. It includes the insurance. You can drive it. You can take it anywhere, but you don't own it. And in many cases, it's cheaper than owning it because owning something is almost going to become like a crime in the future economy. The only ones who can own are the elite and those who will be able to actually afford the high taxation that is going to come with owning something. Imagine there was another way to enjoy a luxury car experience. What if you had no price negotiations? Just one flat monthly rate that includes everything you need, like insurance and maintenance. What if you had access to a concierge service 24-7? designed to make your life easier. What if you could change your car after just 12 months? It's as easy as getting a new phone. Cars are all about freedom. And Volvo Cars is all about making your life less complicated. Discover a new alternative to car ownership, all for a flat monthly fee. Care by Volvo. United Nations, the International Monetary Fund and even Prince Charles boasting, yes, boasting that within a, few, within a few short years, yes, their words, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Remember, this is not me saying this, this is them. They are even running ads for the Great Reset. handful of countries will dominate. I wonder which ones they might be. A terrifying coalition of big business, big tech and left-wing totalitarians that they are now promising you will own nothing and you will be happy. What they should have added is, added is, and we, the very rich, will own everything and be even happier. Of course they will. And those who can actually afford the high taxation that is going to arise with owning something. I tried to find a vehicle the other day for my wife because with my 
current employment status, I travel a lot. So I wanted her to have something reliable that if I'm not there and, and I do drive a lot where I'm at, I can't find anything. I can't. There's no way. Nothing that I could afford. Have you tried to find real estate nowadays? Very hard to find anything. Not anything that you can afford. Very hard. And yes, inflation has a lot to do with that, but the inflation that we're seeing is a manipulated type of an inflation, a created inflation, and one that also is designed at ensuring that you're priced out from owning anything. And all of this is an artificially created inflation system aimed at pushing their agenda. They're masters at creating a problem and then masters at giving you a solution to the problem that they created so that you can crave for the solution. And their solution is one that they've been establishing for a very, very long time. It's all about licenses. It's all about digital agreements. It's all about a permission-based type of a system. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you own a house? Do you own a piece of land? Unless you live in a rural state where these rules and regulations have still not arrived, if you decide today to build a 500 square foot building, could you just build it? Or do you need permission? Or you can build it, but the moment a neighbor calls and reports you, the moment they decide to do an audit at your home, you're going to be in trouble. Why? Because according to the systems in this country of the United States of America, you may own that property, you think, but the reality is, is that number one, let's say for example, you owed it cash, but you didn't pay your taxes. Do you really own that home? Well, meanwhile, Delana family is now fighting for their own home this evening that they could now lose over just $58. In fact, that was the amount of unpaid property taxes on the house in Anderson in Madison County. As Eyewitness News reporter Jenny Runovich explains, now a bank owns the home and this family may have to move. Cabinets and put new floors in the kitchen. The house he's worked so hard on. I do my best trying to keep up with the house. The home they consider a blessing could be taken away from the Combs family at any time. This is the only house he knows. Lost because of $58 in unpaid taxes. A 93-year-old Nashville woman may not have a home to call her own in less than a week if she doesn't get some help fast. The city wants her to pay up or else. News Channel 5 Shannon Royster has the heartbreaking story. Miss Aynor Turner has lived in this home since 1990. Right now she owes about $4,200 in back taxes. If she doesn't pay it, the home will be auctioned off on Wednesday and she'll be forced to move out. Miss Turner received this letter from the city at the end of May, telling her she has until June 17th to pay up. Stella Thompson says her mother was sent tax notices, but because of her age and several health issues, she never really saw them. When the family did, it was too late. I'm trying everything that I can think of, um, you know, calling everyone, you know, apply, we applied for loans, um, and I feel helpless because there's nothing I can do. Ms. Turner's son-in-law says the city won't accept partial payment, so she can't afford to pay the bill in full on a fixed income. You, even though her income didn't go up at all, the property value and the appraisals have more than doubled, which causes the property tax amount to go up. And basically, a lot of the people are being priced out of their homes. As long as we have a place to live, she would have a place, but that, it's just not the same. You know, she wants to be here for the rest of her life. Do you really own that property if you decide not to pay your taxes or they, can they come and confiscate your license for living at that property? You see, when you actually own something, all that is is a beefed up license. All that is is an upgraded type of a license where you have a little bit more privilege. But the reality is, is that if you decide to build, if you decide to do anything, you need their permission. You have to go to the county and ask them, hey, listen, I want to build a 20 foot structure and the county is going to say, wait, we don't allow that. You can build a 15 foot structure and you're going to say, but, but it's my property. I want to build a 20 foot structure. And they'll come back and they'll tell you, sadly, the county does not permit that. And you're going to walk out of there thinking to yourself, wait a minute, don't I own this property? Well, you think you own the property. The reality is, is that it's just an upgraded experience in the digital economy of the Antichrist. It is a sad state of affairs where we're at in this nation. 
But you know what? They're masters of manipulation. You talk to anybody today, they're boasting about the fact that their homes are more expensive, right? Oh, my, my, my land is now worth two times its value. Man, you know what? I I'm feeling good. You're not going to feel good when that tax bill comes. You're not going to feel good when that tax bill comes because the same way inflation works, manipulated inflation works, you are a tenant to that land. And when economic turmoil comes, they will raise the taxes to assist with the economic turmoil and the taxation system in this country. You're essentially a tenant on that land and you have rights to that land. You have a license to that land. As long as you comply with the regulations, the permits designed for you to build and much more. Oh, you want to build a well? You need a permit. You want water? You need a permit. You want power? You need a permit. You want septic? You need a permit. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? That's the society that we are in. So now that you can kind of understand how to drive, you need a license. To build, you need a license and a permit. To travel, you need everything. When you purchase a movie, a digital movie, you don't really own it because you're buying the license. In fact, it's even affecting physical property. I'm hoping that this has already changed, but at the very least, a year or two ago, John Deere tractor owner, they could buy the John Deere tractor and that's an expensive tractor, but they did not have the license to actually fix it. You would have to take it to an actual mechanic that they can charge whatever they want because they're John Deere mechanics. You think you own it, but you don't really own it. We're gonna make a U-turn right up here and I'll take you by the field we're cutting. We're cutting peas over here. You know, in the agriculture, we run things till they're dead, and then we run them a little bit more after that. There's a tractor sitting in the shop here that was built in 1943. We don't dispose of things on the farm. We keep them running forever. And it's important to us as farmers, in order to keep our costs down, when we buy something, we need to run it a long time to make it pay out. From this model on, you know, everything's basically run by the computer and the tractor. Companies feel that all the programming and the technology that's in the tractor, they continue to own after they sell me the tractor. So you're saying I have to pay for this, but you own it. I mean, there's some really fuzzy things that happen there. At this point in time, if I want diagnostics done, I have one option, and that's to call my dealer. If a farmer out here through his own ingenuity can fix something, I think he should be able to do so. And bluntly, I think that's the way it should be, whether we're talking about tractors or cell phones or computers. So on that truck, you, you can get all the software you need for that? Yeah, trucks, cars, automotive, you can buy whatever you want. Okay, but you just can't get it for the tractors. So if you had a brand new tractor sitting here, you couldn't do anything with it, could you, if you didn't no. have? If, it, if check engine light was on, I couldn't even tell you why, why the check engine light was on. So an independent mechanic can buy the software to work on a new car. You can't do that in agriculture. What farmers find themselves doing, we're stuck in a gray area where we're using hack software from Europe or wherever, Timbuktu. In the old days, you needed basically a wrench and a hammer and a pry bar. Today, they have embedded firmware all over these equipment systems. So you'll need to have software just to get it started, activated, and calibrated. So I guess hacking and fixing to me is the same thing. All these things have to be looked at to protect not only the farm community and the people out here, but to protect food security. It, it's a huge issue. And that can only come with legislation. Many of you know this already, but in case you have not gotten the memo, you yourself are a product in the corporation of the United States of America. The United States of America is a huge corporation. And in this corporation, anytime a new product is born, you get a birth certificate and you get a social security number assigned to that product. When that product is gone, you get a death certificate and that social security number is taken out of the system. You are a product. 
you're rated by your credit on that social security number as well. So that product has a tracking mechanism so that you can conduct business in the world around you. You need that social security number to be able to apply for a job. You need that social security number to apply for a mortgage, an apartment, anywhere. You need it. Without it, you're not a product. Without it, you're not part of this corporation. If you happen to come over here in a visa, you get a temporary number to allow you to conduct business in the corporation of the United States of America. But regardless, you need that. And you know that corporations perform inventories, right? Inventories are needed in corporations. It allows them to keep a track of their product and the United States of America and many other countries conduct censuses. They do a census. The census allows them to see how many people there are and keep track of their product. We're headed towards an age. We're headed towards a moment, brother and sister in the Lord, where that tracking mechanism is no longer good enough for them. We're headed towards a day and age of transhumanism. And the people are very much willing to accept it, okay? And in the digital economy of the Antichrist, transhumanism is going to reign supreme. You must understand that Proverbs 15, 16, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. We're headed towards days where you need to remember that. We're headed towards days where just as we've seen since 2020, that there have been a lot of mandates. These mandates, in my humble opinion, were a test to see how far they can get away with. And notice that I am not speaking on what's behind the mandate. I'm only speaking on the mandates to make sure that this complies with YouTube. But you know what I'm talking about. Many for not complying with the mandate were terminated from their employment. Many for not complying for the mandate couldn't even get a heart surgery. That's how this world has become. And sadly for you and for me, most of the masses agree with that. Because you see people, the people have almost accepted that they're a product. The people have almost accepted that there's no other option but to comply. The people have all but accepted that this is the future, that this is the way. And we're in a day and age that as technology is advancing, in the economy of the Antichrist, that we're going to see AI perform work that human beings are not able to perform. You see, artificial intelligence in the economy of the Antichrist is going to be able to perform your job 10, 20 times better. AI does not call out to work. AI does not request vacation. AI does not get tired. AI will sell products and repeat the pitch 20 times a day if it has to. We're going to focus on a call center scenario, since this is a common use case. But the concepts you'll learn here will apply to many other scenarios as well. Organizations across industries rely on call centers to help provide excellent customer service. These call center interactions can be a source of rich information about customer needs, employee performance, and more that's largely untapped. Call centers today often sample just a fraction of calls to understand agent performance. And customer insights are often classified manually by agents during or after the call, which can be inefficient and error prone. With AI, organizations are increasingly building intelligent call centers, which automate processes and enable them to gain learnings from every customer call. This can help reduce costs, identify areas of improvement, and improve customer experience. This diagram represents the main components of an intelligent call center built on Azure AI. Over the next few minutes, I'll walk you through some basics of Azure's speech and language cognitive services. The first step in creating an intelligent call center solution is typically to implement automated transcription of calls, which can be done using speech service. calling Harper Valley National Bank. My name is Grace. How can I help you today? Uh, yes, last night I was entertaining some clients and I think I left my wallet at the restaurant and to be safe, I want to replace my debit card. Mm -hmm. Before I 
where I can help you with that. I'll have to authenticate you, okay? Okay. May I ask who I'm talking with first and last name, please? My name is Chris Johnson. Mm hmm And what was the name of your first pet? Um, Professor Sparkles. Okay, great. That's Professor Sparkles. All right, let me check that information you gave me. Okay, Mr. Johnson, just checking your name. Looking through your security questions. Professor Sparkles. Oh my god, that's precious. Oh, he was precious. Okay, I just submitted your request. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. You are authenticated. Okay, should I go ahead and submit that request for your new debit card? Yes. Okay. This will result in a mass loss of employment for a lot of people. And as these job losses continue to add up, and we're not there yet, folks, uh, we're going to be heading towards a road. I'm trying to paint for you a road map of what I see coming, not because I'm a prophet, not because I, I saw from God and I was eating some popcorn and I saw a vision. No, just because as your brother, I've been keeping up with all of this stuff. And it's better to use wisdom, man. Use wisdom and get prepared. Okay? Not out of fear, but get prepared for what is coming. Eventually, they're going to roll out some sort of a universal basic income in the digital economy of the Antichrist. And with the universal basic income, just as you saw mandates take over from 2020 to 2022, right? There are going to be requirements. They're going to be obligation to be a part of such a system. At the end of the day, if you want the government to take care of their product, the product better align itself with the requirements of the corporation. Because at the end of the day, the corporation can then say, you have to take this or else you won't get the UBI. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. Okay. What to do about mass unemployment? This is going to be a massive social yes. challenge. Um, and I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have a choice. Universal basic Un income. Universal basic income. I think it's going to be necessary. So it means that unemployed people will be paid across the globe. Yeah. Because there is no job. Machine, robot is taking over. Um, that, that's simply the, the... And I want to be clear that these, these are not... Uh, things that I think that I wish would happen. These are think, simply things that I think probably will happen. My flagship proposal is a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for every American adult starting at age 18. So that means that you would receive $1,000 a month every month. And this is a renaming of something called universal basic income, a policy that's been with the country since our founding. Thomas Paine was for it. He called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King fought for it in 1967 in his book, Chaos or Community. And it is what he was fighting for every day up to the day he was assassinated in 1968. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed a study saying this would be tremendous for America. And it even passed the US House of Representatives twice in 1971. It came this close to being law. So this is not as radical as, as you might think. 44% of American jobs will be subject to automation in the next 20 to 30 years, 20 to 30 percent in the next 10 to 20 years. I mean, think about what that means. The most common jobs in the U.S. economy are administrative and clerical, which includes call center workers, retail and sales, food service and food prep, truck driving and transportation, and manufacturing. Those five sectors are all going to shrink, and that's half of American jobs. And then you're looking at other white-collar jobs like insurance agents and financial advisors and accountants and bookkeepers, radiologists. Like, a lot of professions are going to get affected by this. Because you're causing excess costs to the healthcare system. And for the UBI to work properly, we all have to do our parts. With smart vehicles that are being rolled out right now, they're going to be able to track how you drive. If you speed too much, did you break too fast? Did you take the shortest route? Carbon tax credits will emerge eventually for that UBI at some point in time whenever it arrives. 
you're going to see that they're going to push towards a digital ID. And this digital ID is already being pushed. We see that for the mandate, they have digital IDs already to make sure that you've complied with it. And what will people do? I mean, think of it now. In 2020, 21, 2022, a lot of people out of fear had to comply with the mandate or else they would not be able to feed their families. And I want you to keep this in perspective. In the digital economy of the Antichrist that is rising, if people now in 2020, 2021, 2022, when they have a choice to say, well, I, I may not make the same, but I can leave for another job and maybe work two jobs and not comply with the mandate, and people are not making that choice? Imagine when there are no other jobs that you can actually function in because AI has been able to take over. You see, in the digital economy of the candy Christ, you may not necessarily see that cop on that corner. The stuff that you see in movies, it's prepared people for what is coming. You see a cop, you have to pay a pension, you have to pay costs, you have to pay so many things for security costs. There are people actually, there are states that have actually banned the police, right? They've said disband the police because they're not fair and they're racist. Well, AI solves that because AI is going to have an algorithm that is only going to arrest those that it see violating crime. But guess what else AI can do? AI can run and run and run and chase you and not get tired. AI can monitor you 24-7 like nothing. And the technologies are scary. And we hear about nations like Sweden which have adopted the microchip like nothing. But folks, the technologies that they have hidden from you, that they are going to unleash, are going to possibly make a microchip under your arm look like the most savage thing ever. Because with the nano chips that they have, with the nanotechnology that is coming, the tracking mechanisms that they will provide for you are going to feel as comfortable as you placing a pair of iPods in your ear. You see that phone that you carry every day. That device that you cannot live without. Eventually, they will sell you a package where just like with Elon Musk's Neuralink, you'll be able to link up your brain to the system. The digital economy of the Antichrist is one that wants you to merge with the machine. It's a technology that wants you to submit yourself to their algorithm fully. To be able to function. To be able to operate. To be able to buy, to be able to sell, to be able to trade. And you're already seeing the emergence of a digital currency. The entire crypto phase. With cryptocurrencies, you know, you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, all of these cryptocurrencies. It's emerged with a technology called blockchain. And with blockchain, you have a public ledger that allows two people to conduct business and the ledger keep track of it without a middleman, just the ledger. And you have people that can send a million dollars to South America for pennies compared to what you can send it at a local bank. In fact, with cryptocurrencies and DeFi, if today you went to KuCoin and you had $500, right? And you wanted to invest $10,000, you can get a loan for that $500. You just better not get liquidated. And you don't have to talk to a representative. You don't have to talk to a bank. You don't have to talk to a teller. You don't have to spend hours in the bank begging them to let, lend you some money. You get to borrow that literally in seconds. Because the algorithm has now provided a way, a medium for people to function within the algorithm without a human. We see the central banks rolling out their CBDC. We see China doing a successful rollout of their CBDC, their digital currency. Folks, you have to see where this is headed. If you don't see where this is headed, I don't know what to tell you. The Federal Reserve might want to fix your wallet by turning it from this into this. Though your wallet is still designed for dollar bills, Americans have been using cash to buy things less and less over the years. That's part of why the Fed is considering digitizing the US dollar, giving people money they can access on their phone in bypassing electronic payments that can be slow and costly for businesses. Some see this as a necessary upgrade to the US financial system, but others worry it could potentially upend commercial banking. There are some very, very difficult questions to answer, but I think we, and we are engaged in, a serious program to understand both the technology and the policy issues. 
A central bank digital currency, or CBDC, is exactly what it sounds like a purely digital form of a country's money issued by its central bank that people can use just like cash. It's true that cards and apps already allow for electronic payment, but behind the scenes, these financial transactions involve several steps, settling payments over a patchwork of systems. The plumbing of the system is still based on a cash system. Josh Lipsky is the director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center and says the U.S. financial system is still pretty old school when it comes to moving money around. You know, it's based on banks talking to banks, saying, hey, I need you to transfer this to me. We've updated some of that over the years, but he actually, if you were to look back, a lot of it dates back to the 1950s and before. And that's not a great way to run a modern global economy. After a debit card is swiped, the transaction can flow through several entities, including point of sale systems, payment networks like Visa and MasterCard, your bank, and the Merchants Bank. The system can take up to three days to move money between accounts and often comes with transaction fees that can weigh heavily on small businesses, who experts say may have to pass the cost onto customers or put restrictions on card usage. These extra costs can limit their revenues and customer base. CBDCs could bypass the system, allowing digital money to flow directly between two people in the same way you hand over cash at the register. One method the Fed is considering is issuing digital wallets to Americans directly, or through commercial banks or other financial service providers. The digital dollars themselves would be no more than computer code, possibly stored on a central ledger at the Fed or on a distributed ledger like many cryptocurrencies. When you use your wallet to pay for something, the Fed would take the digital cash out of your wallet and deposit it into the merchants, simplifying the process and doing it without fees. And I'm not saying this so that you can be afraid of the digital economy of the Antichrist. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that so that you can take all of what we've been through in 2020, 21, 21, 2022, all, all that we've been through as a huge lesson of what can happen at any moment when the economic systems decide that you must comply or else you're kicked out of their corporation and their system. You know, in Revelation 13, 17 through 20, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We're in a world that the number one thing that it will use to manipulate you is money. That is the number one thing that it will use to manipulate you. When you really think about it, what's that dollar bill in your pocket? It's nothing more than a piece of paper. It doesn't have any value to it. When you think of cryptocurrencies, where, where's the value in it? It's nothing more than digital numbers. The value in it is the fact that they can track everything that you do. People used to say Bitcoin is, this, the government hates Bitcoin. No, the government loves Bitcoin. It can track everything you do. There's nothing you can do there that is not tracked. Everything is saved on the ledger. And the IRS wants to know your picture now. They want to know your face now. They want to know everything about you. The digital economy of the Antichrist, number one manipulation tactic, number one way of manipulating you and placing fear in you is money. But you have a choice, right? And in Revelation 3, verse 18, it says, And I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in wine raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesol, that thou mayest see. In times like these, as always, decisions have to be made. What I'm sharing with you today is that in 2020, 2021, 2022, it was the mandate fever. Now it's cooling off. Now you're seeing that the UK is cooling off from it. Now you see that the United States of America is cooling off from it. It'll cool off for a little bit. For a couple of years, maybe. Who knows? I don't know. You don't know. But learn your lesson. The lesson is, you are not of this world. You are not of this world. You're from another kingdom. And because you're not of this world, do not live like the people in this world. Make better decisions now. Not tomorrow, not next week. 
now. When you're going to go eat out, ask yourself, is this worth it or not? Should I buy a $15 combo because now the combos are expensive? Or should I buy 10 pounds of ground beef and make my own burgers for a couple of days? Take that money and save it. And try to do everything you possibly can so that when the moments come of difficulty, you are in a position that the decisions are easier to make. You see, because when you're in a position like Section 8, for example, Section 8 for many women has a lot of restrictions. OK, Section 8 is a trap. And I'll put a video to that at the end of this video. With Section 8, many good women find good men. But if they marry that man, then at that point in time, they lose their Section 8. Or with food stamps, who are the first people that will easily fall into this system? Most likely those that are in a position that because of one thing or another, they're going through a rough moment. I've taken food stamps. Listen, that's the best grocery shopping you can ever do. When I had food stamps, man, I'll be picking up all the snacks. You know, that Red Baron pizza, ooh, Tony's pizza, Jamaican patties. I'm serious. When you have food stamps, that's the best grocery shopping you could ever do, man. Some Yoohoo, <laughs> you name it. But when you're in a position that your food is controlled by the corporation, your income is controlled by the corporation, your rent is controlled by the corporation, that's where the digital economy of the Antichrist is going to reign supreme in the houses of many. Can you now understand that you will own nothing? You will own nothing and be happy. So knowing where they're headed, use godly wisdom and do everything you possibly can to abstain yourself from the temptations to live like the world. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand and the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will soup with him and he with me. Today, we've talked about a lot of topics in one video. There's no way that I can tackle all these topics without rushing through all of them. One key message that I want to leave you with today is behold, I stand at the door and knock. There is a God who is knocking at your door today. There's a God who knows that you came to watch this documentary and you've learned a lot with the documentary. That's perfectly fine and dandy, but you're going through depression. You've learned a lot about all of these things, but you're anxious, you're depressed. You have anger, you have fear, you have worry, you have sin in your life that no one else knows about. You have temptations that have taken over your life and you're not who you once used to be. You're not that person that you used to be in the Lord. You want to come back home. And as you want to come back home, the devil is telling you with intrusive thoughts. That's why the word of God says casting down imaginations, right? Casting down imaginations and taking them to the authority of Jesus Christ. Take them to the word of God. He'll tell you, now you're going to pray. After you've done all of that, you think God is going to listen to you? Those are lies from Satan. I want to pray with you today. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your dear Son. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for purchasing the church with your own blood. Acts 20, 28. Thank you for delivering us from the kingdoms of darkness. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you for helping us in our marriages, even when we feel like we can no longer continue. Thank you for helping us with our children, even when they're driving us bananas. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for helping us with our employment, even when we thought we were at a point where we had to find another. Father, there are brothers and sisters right now that are backslidden, that are watching this video right there where they're at. Convict their hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. We've learned a lot in this video. We've talked about a lot in this video, Heavenly Father. But what good is any of this knowledge if we're headed to hell? 
What good is any of this knowledge if we're on a road map, if we're directly headed towards hell? Today, Heavenly Father, convict their hearts. Remind them of your love. Remind them of how much you care for them. Remind them of what you can do for them. Remind them of who you are because you stand at the door and knock. You don't just open the door. You can, but you just don't do it that way because you want a man and a woman to humbly repent and turn to you. I pray that if you're watching this video right now, today you open that door. If any man hear my voice and open the door, open the door and I will come into him and will soup with him and he with me. Today, will you allow that to happen? I pray that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. Thank you for taking the long time to watch this video. I don't even know if you made it through it. For those that actually made it through the whole video, let me know in the comment section. That's a blessing. And please take a few minutes to share the content. If you don't share the content, um, I think it'll be buried in the algorithm at some point. Text it to a friend, text it to a neighbor, Facebook, wherever you want to. Um, aside from that, thank you for the prayers. Thanks for all that you do for the ministry. We truly appreciate it. Thanks for the support. Uh, God bless you. I'll leave you with a couple more documentaries at the end of this video. Consider watching them. And remember, on Roku Systems, Bible TV. Check us out there. And what can I say? Thank you for taking the time. You know, I know this is a long video, but um, I hope it edified you in any type of a way. And like I mentioned, regardless of what is coming, Satan is defeated. Use godly wisdom to prepare Use godly wisdom to repent because he stands at the door and is knocking. Open the door. God bless.